So what persuaded you to become a land girl? Well, I joined the Land Army, I think I just wanted uh, something different. I didn't want to go into the Air Force or the Army, and I, uh, I liked the idea of the open air life. Well, we saw this advert that said, join the Land Army and have a free holiday. And we were short of money, so we thought, not a bad idea. So we went in and made inquiries about it, and ended up by joining up, and then forgot all about it until the day after war was declared and then uh, I received my calling up papers. Both my sisters were in the Land Army, my older sisters, and I didn't want to go on munitions, so I thought they seemed to be enjoying their life with the Land Army, so I did. Because I wanted to join the Navy, I wanted to be a Wren, my father and my brother were in the Navy and my father made me promise I wouldn't. Join up, I'd stay with my mother. The only way I could stay with my mother was by joining the Land Army because when the Land Army came round to interview me and as they promised her I shouldn't leave home or be too far away from home, she gave her consent because you had to have your parents' consent uh, up until I think it was 21 those days and I was just 18. Uh, and that was why I joined the Land Army, really, to get away from home. I was 19 and I had to register. And I thought, oh, I would have liked the land, uh, the uh, RAF or the WAFs. I would have liked the ATS or the Wrens. But I didn't want factory work. Well, with the others, you had to have a few brains. I wanted to get a few stripes. So I thought, oh no, I'll go for the land army which I did. I volunteered for the Land Army when I registered at 19. Brilliant. Were your family supportive of that decision that you made? Well, they were surprised because I was afraid of a mouse or a rat. Were your family supportive of that? Supportive of no, that my mother wasn't. She was angry because I told her I'd joined and I hadn't. And she felt yeah. that I'd, um, she'd seen land girls, as she said, with cigarettes in their mouths and hats on. And I'd be like the women that worked on the farm and no boy would want to go out with me. And I was sent to Rees Heath Agricultural College uh, for um, a month's training. And uh, in that training I learned so much about every aspect of uh, farming. Um, you know, uh, crop uh, um, uh, rotation and things like that and of, uh, how, how to milk and all the different machinery that one uses and how to drive a tractor and of course had all this training for a month and I really enjoyed every minute of it. I was put in a hostel with, oh, must have been about 20 or 30 other girls. That was in Russell Mwai. I did my training there. After that we were all sent to other places and I went to Hereford and I was put in a hostel there and it was all girls together. After the billet, um, another land girl and I got a cottage between us on the farm so we didn't have to travel into them. But the cottage had no water, no electricity and uh, no toilets or anything because there weren't any toilets then. They were just buckets down the bottom of the garden. And, um, but we, we loved it there, we really loved it. <laughs> yes, it was going back to nature, but it was very nice, yes. I was very happy there, yes, because, because I knew the person who was looking after us. And how did you know her? How did I know her? Yeah. She was my mother. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> so I was sent to this place, um, to um, a, f uh, a farm near Coventry and um, it was on that farm uh, there was a searchlight unit and consequently when um, the, the Germans sort of attacked the first thing they used to go for was the searchlight unit so we had bombs on the farm and night after night we were put out in sentries when Coventry was concentrated and uh, it was a very very sad time because the, the person where I lived, um, she would only take in the, the people that fled from 
Coventry who'd got children and we'd put them all under this massive table, cover the children up and then everybody would have to go out because there weren't any fire extinguishers for us there. We still had raids, we had these what they called a doodle bug yeah. and it looked like a plane with flames flying out and when the engine stopped it just dropped so wherever you you know and I can remember being up a tree picking plums and standing and saying oh look look it's a doodle bug the next minute one of the men had pulled me down off the tree and I was laying face down in stinging nettles I was born in London and to me the country was a foreign country, you know, it's um, strange, I've never been out of London. The nearest I got to fields and things was Kew Gardens, but uh, we stuck it out and we made it. The geese were dreadful, <laughs> they used to attack you and bite you at the back of the legs, you know. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you something very quickly because I put up with this, this particular great gander who used to chase me around and the one I wasn't in a good mood, it was a horrid day and it came at the back of me and it gave me such a twit, you know, and I'm afraid I kicked it and it went up in the air like a great big, oh wow, you know, with its neck and I thought it had died, but it hadn't actually and it was all right, it gathered, didn't come near me after that. <laughs> How did the farmers react to you? Uh, the farmers? Um, they, they were quite nice generally, I mean, you never did enough work, they always thought you could do a bit more. Uh, the two fellows that I worked with, they were very resentful of the land army and before ever I arrived there, evidently in the local pub, there'd been bets on to how long this land girl would last and the most they'd given me was three weeks. The work was very hard, but I loved it. I found it difficult at first. The first day, I, the job I was given was to lead a horse <laughs> to help the man that had the, um, I think it was a sh shimmer it was called, and I had this big 17 hands horse called Captain. Well, the horse led me. You, you just got adjusted to these things. You knew that they were going to be heavy because you were doing a man's job, really, because they were in the military whatever, they were at war, so while these jobs were hard and the weather was nasty. We were up at six, breakfast, and like they were in other services, and we worked till the sun went down sometimes. I, I actually belonged to a gang of six who went and worked on a threshing machine, and we used to just move round the farms. And when I came back to Sussex, I, were, I drove a tractor and ploughed drove tractors, I worked in the fields, I made butter, I made cheese. My favourite job was with the cows, milking and cleaning out, washing, washing them down. And Get the cows in and then milk them and then put them out and clean out the barns and then if it was winter time we used to, I used to get a horse and cart out with food, uh, mangles or swedes or whatever and take those out to the cattle and hay and straw and take those out to the cattle in the field. So could you tell me a little bit more about the tree spraying? We had a nicotine water mixed and so the back of the tractor, which would always be on, it would be agitating this mixture. From this tank there was, oh, metres I suppose you'd call them now, of piping and you'd have to go round the trees and reach right up to the top. Now this was to kill all the insects so that you could have the blossom and that would bring the fruit. And so you'd work your way all the way around a tree and of course you get all wet through because you get all drippings. And by the end of the season, because it was only a seasonal job, my hair was green, my nails were green, all the hairs on your face turned green, which would be fashionable now. Yeah. If you wanted your hair, the only thing was to have it bleached. We would work from about seven, and get back at seven o'clock at night, and we had a little packet of either bread and cheese or bread and jam, and that went on for about three months. We turned up one day, and on the table, was our, she put our dinner, 
and I poked it with a fork and I said, what's this? And she said, eat it, she says, there's a lot of goodness and nutrition. Scrape it off of the gristle inside and eat it. When you're hungry, dear, you'll eat anything, I'll tell you that, and we were hungry in those days. So I scraped it off and after I'd eaten it, I said, well, what was it? And she said, they've been docking the lamb's tails today. So they were lamb's tails. What happened if you needed the toilet and you were in the middle of the field? <laughs> well, I think you probably found a bush somewhere. You just went. <laughs> I remember one day <coughs> the farmer saying to me, well, what is it that you miss most, Ivy? And I said, I miss a bath a week. I just love to have a bath. And so he said, well, has Mrs. Um, Bates got, uh, hasn't she offered anything? I said, no, never. He said, well, you ask her. And he said, if not, you can come and have a bath here a week. So I spoke to Mrs. Bates about this, and she said, oh, bath. I don't know where the bath is. And she started, oh, uh, said to her son, do you know where the bath is? Anyway, after a lot of search, they found a tin bath in the barn. And so I cleaned it out with the help of the son. And uh, it meant that they had to go right down uh, to the stream to get water to be boiled in saucepans and kettles and that. And when I had this bath, <clears throat> after I'd finished it, the daughter said to me, Ivy, she said, leave the water, please. She said, um, I'll have a bath next. So anyway, she had a bath, and then uh, she said to her husband, Ted, it's about time you had a bath. So they added more water to it, and so Ted had a bath. And then the old lady, Mrs Bates, she said, don't you dare throw that water away. She said, um, I'll wash my feet. And that was <laughs> the bath. And after that, I spoke to the, my farmer. And after that, I had a bath at his place every week. Then. Okay. That was off my hat. Was that regulation you had to wear that? Oh, that was the uniform. Yeah. And an armband. And every six months, you'd have a, like half a diamond. And you'd be that proud when you had this first half a diamond, you see. You'd sew it on. Oh. The next six months, you'd have another half a diamond, and that would make the whole diamond. Well, you'd look and you'd think, oh, they've been in, they're amateurs, you know. And you'd have this one, we've been in 12 months, you know. Right. In those days, you had double summertime, which meant you could work till midnight, sometimes one o'clock, and you'd have the. Um, the moon shining, all the tractors around, and you'd be working in the fields uh, at that time. And the no loveliest memory was when we were bringing the load of the hay in, and we would lie on the top of it, you see, and the moon was out, the smell of the hay was absolutely intoxicating, and we would be singing all the latest pop songs. You'd go home, you would, <laughs> you would uh, have a bath in a tin bath because there were no, you know, and there might be three of us and have to use the same water, but you'd be grateful you could do that. And then you would um, go to bed and be up at five o'clock to milk the cows. And uh, sometimes, you know, and then sometimes we'd go to a dance after all that. You know, we were mad fools. We, we had a lovely time. We worked hard, but enjoyed it. Did you have time for a social life amongst all your odd jobs that you did? Yes, we had a very good social life. We were fortunate. We lived just outside Hereford town itself, but there was a naffy, and the naffy who had a piano. Well, a naffy is like a huge canteen for servicemen, but um, they allowed land girls in there, so we were, had a lovely mixture. <laughs> in the village, we had a, a, a land army club, and we called it the Gowlack Club. I did try it once to go try dancing but I found I couldn't get up in the morning so I cut that out and so, so what did you do in your spare time? Um, well I used to do a lot of knitting and sewing and things like that in the evenings yes in the summer that is but uh, but of course a lot of the time we had to work, work till about 10 o'clock at night in the um, haymaking and harvesting time, so really there wasn't a lot of spare time at all. But it was really the church hall which was the only 
place of social life there was in the villages. And we used to go and there'd be possibly three people in a band or uh, playing instruments. And it used to be the, the weekly dance on a Saturday night. Uh, a great event every time it was. Um, because um, it was a church hall, there was never any drinks or anything like that. Possibly cups of tea, but that is all. And then to go home, which used to be fairly late at night, although we had a, a time we had to be in at 11 o'clock, uh, or they say the door would be locked. Uh, and because the farm boys always had a, a bicycle, and with a crossbar in those days, and we used to sit on the crossbar and the local boys would take us back to our uh, wherever we lived. Were there any scandals like love affairs? Or... Oh yeah, of course there was. I mean we were young, uh, we always had love affairs. And, uh, uh, um, now let's get this straight, love affairs of those days weren't like the love affairs of today. We were very, very innocent and ignorant right at the beginning to be honest with you. You learnt to protect yourself as time went by. But I, my husband and I, I met him towards the end of the war, and we met and married in six weeks. And did you have any relationships with the farmers, farm boys, or boys in the area? Um, well, there was a boy in the village who used to come and sort me out, but <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't have a lot of time with him, and it never came to anything. Ooh, lots of little romances, I mean, you know, but. Uh, why not? 17-year-olds, 20-year-olds, REF boys. After all, you know, that's what nature does, isn't it? <laughs> I was quite friendly with an American boy, and he was super. But I only met him to go dancing. There was two of them, and my friend and I. And um, the last time I saw him, actually, he said, one day I'm going to make a date with you and I won't turn up and, as he put it, not on account of I don't want to, but on account of I won't be able to. And he went abroad on D-Day, well we gathered that, and I haven't heard from him since, he was American so. Did you ever have any secret romances amongst all the Oh shows? well, you've mentioned the word secret, I'm keeping it secret. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I had a boyfriend who's still with me now, and he's 83. <laughs> when I was in the Land Army, I was home at the weekend. My father was there, and he said to me, what are you doing this morning? That was a Sunday. I said, I'm going to church, Dad. So upstairs I went, and I came downstairs in my breeches, shirt, jumper. He said, I thought you was going to church. I said, I am, Dad. He said, you're not going to church dressed as a man. I said, but this is my uniform. He said, I don't care. You're not going to go to church dressed as a man. And you know, even till this day, only once since, and whether it was but if I ever worn trousers to church, I could hear my father say, you're not to go to church dressed as a man. How did you feel about getting a medal after 45 years? Yes, it was quite thrilling, really, to think, uh, you know, after all these years, you know. I don't think we were portrayed enough, to be honest. It's only this last two years we've even been recognised. And this is the first time we've ever had a badge or anything, you know. And lots of the Lang girls didn't even get that because they'd passed on. Did you ever look back upon your experience as a land girl and regret or doubt your choice to become a land girl? I haven't met a land girl that didn't like it. I'm very glad I did it, yes. I'm very pleased I did it. Was it worth it? Yes. I've never yet heard of a land girl that didn't like what she did, you know, and would do it all over again. Yeah. It was amazing how all the ladies were part of the same organisation, but they all had really different experiences. I was really interested in how the land girls lived on the farm. I was really interested in hearing the land girl stories such as Beryl kicking the goose. Learning about the land girls has been a real inspiration to me because I was talking to one of the land girls and she was a teacher at the London Fashion College on Oxford Street, but then she became a land girl, so it shows that you can follow your dreams and help your country as well. I thought it was really good that we got to meet the land girls, and it was good that they finally got recognised after so many years. 
I really enjoyed listening to the land girls' stories about how they went to the naffy and dancing. They had fun like we do and are not so different from us. I really enjoyed the whole project, but the thing I enjoyed the most was probably meeting the land girls and finding out like, about their life. Life was more normal then than we think about it now. I liked finding out how similar their lives were to our lives. Throughout this experience, I've probably learned more about World War II than I think. When I first came here, I've never even heard of the land girls or who, were, who they were. And also, I've learned that by looking at photographs, you can retract information and discover more than you think. Because photographs can tell a different story each time. They're not just about pictures and stuff. World War II is more than just men fighting out war and being brave. It's also about land girls taking over the men's jobs. During this experience, I've learned how to interview people, and now I know that there is more to interviewing than there seems. From this experience, I love learning about what the land girls got up to. I learned that women did have an impact on the war. I was surprised at how open and friendly they were in the interviews. Meeting the land girls has given me more interest in history. I also learned that whatever age you are, you can still have fun and enjoy life. Everyone was so nice, kind, helpful. Oh, I found that the uh, questions that the students asked were most intelligent. And, and they were so articulate and lovely yeah. to look at as well, weren't they? <laughs> uh, you, know, you could tell that they were interested, you know, in uh, what they're doing and what they wanted to know. Yeah. And they were really interested in what we were doing. I had a lovely day there. The children were all very good. Really wanted to know what was happening. Um, yes, it was dealt with so many different questions, you didn't always know what to answer because it's a long while ago and you forget what went on. It so amazes me that after all these years that um, we're, we're having uh, the, these remembered interviews. remembered us. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you think it's quite important that we capture it on film and so we've got it for future generations? It, yes, I do because um, it is a thing that was forgotten. Mm. Nobody, lots of people time. don't know anything about it, and now suddenly it's come back. We we recognised after all these years. So uh, if this doesn't happen, it will be a forgotten age. Well, I have three children, and I'm going to insist that they go to Brighton Museum <laughs> in October and see their mum. <laughs>